Okay. Um, friends and relatives and colleagues, it is my honor to introduce to you our next keynote speaker, Harlan Prudin. Harlan is uh, Ni Yo Hao, uh, First Nations from the First Nations Cree Nation, works with and for uh, the Two-Spirit community locally nas and nationally. Uh, currently, Harlan is the Indigenous Knowledge Translation Lead at Chimamuk, an Indigenous health program at British, the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control, and is also a co-founder of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, Turtle Island's first research group or lab that exclusively focuses on Two-Spirit people, communities, and or experiences. Harlan is also the managing editor for the twospiritjournal.com and an advisory member for the Canadian Institute of Health Research Institute of Gender Health, Gender and Health. Before relocating to Vancouver in 2015, Harlan was co-founder and a director of the NYC community-based organization, the Northeast Two Spirit Society, and a pres and was a President Obama appointee to the US Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS and provided advice, in information and recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and <clears throat> the White House. Friends and relatives, please join me in welcoming Harlan Pruden. Hi Chika, thank you Harlan. Dante, um, Len, for that beautiful opening uh, and sharing um, your these protocols, which I think, um, you know, it's all protocols in which that we as a Cree person is, a, I also try to live and, and to, to be. Um, Dante, Nitichem Tika Harlan Pruden, Ewakat no Mani, Niha, Nihau, Niha, Ayakwe. Greetings, my relatives. Uh, my government name is Harlan Pruden, and my um, Indian name, and I do use the I word, you can ask me why uh, later. Um, my Indian name is actually in Sioux. I was doing uh, some work on the Rosebud Reservation, some two spirit work. And they honored me with the name in a naming ceremony of Waka no Mani. Waka being spirit, like good spirit, bad spirit, uh, neutral spirit. You know, I can do good just as well as I can do bad, or I can like suck up a lot of space and do absolutely nothing, which I hope I don't do. Uh, so that part of my name is a responsibility of how do I want to show up. And so I try to show up uh, with good words, good action, and good thoughts. Okay, so I have to work on the thoughts bit, okay? But that's my intent. Um, and then if I don't meet that intent, um, we would call that a mistake or a misstep. I look at mistakes and missteps as um, learning opportunity. And when I do make a misstep or a mistake, I immediately own it and say, oh, I am so sorry. How can I do better? So we must look at um, mistakes and missteps as learning opportunities. Um, Nome is to and Mani is a sacred journey. Um, and so that is my full name. Um, and I also like that it's incredibly complex, right? It's not Skywalker. <laughs> um, there, there's a nuance to that. And so I really I deeply appreciate uh, my, um, my Sioux relatives. I am First Nations Cree. And in my humble opinion, the best nation in the whole wide world. My mother is um, from the Beaver Lake Indian Reserve. My father is from the Saddle Lake Indian Reserve. A reserve, two different reservations, but the same Cree nation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can I get a nod from someone that you can see my screen? Perfect, thanks, Len. Um, so we're going to be talking, um, oh, my other name is going to be Motormouth Mabel because I have a lot of content and I'm going to be speaking really fast. So you can just call me Mabel, okay? We're going to talk about uh, decolonizing research, collecting and handling two-spirit data in a culturally affirming ways. It is such an honor to be here to share some of these uh, teachings as well as to hold space and place for my two-spirit people. You know, and so I just, often we were being stigmatized and like pushed off to the side. And, um, and so it does me so good. And I'm all nervous because these are, are, these are indigenous people and it's an indigenous research conference. And uh, 
So creating a space for, um, for myself as well as members of my community is such an honor. So thank you so, so much. Uh, before I go any further, I would recognize and do a recognition of the point of um, reference and doing a land acknowledgement. Now, although I come from the best nation in the whole wide world, in my humble opinion, um, my ways come second to the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, nation and first people. And so this land acknowledgement is to remind myself that I am a guest, and I can say that I'm a guest because I approached all three protocol offices when I moved here and asked if I could be invited or I could be recognized as a guest. Um, and so I like to that spirit of um, the first protocol, I would just like to say that I tried to uphold. Also a part of this land acknowledgement <clears throat> is to position me to remind me myself that I am uh, a guest and that if I don't carry myself in a good way and an honorable way, that um, my host may think nasty things of Harlan, but worse, they may make some judgments about my Cree people. So in that respect, I carry myself as an ambassador for my Cree people. And so that I bring honor not only to myself, but honor to my people. And I think we all have people um, and then I also, um, you know, if I don't do this land acknowledgement and the importance of this land acknowledgement, I kind of liken it to me walking into your house. And if we carry that analogy forward, I would start telling you how and when to live and to how you operate in your own house. I would start telling you when to do your dishes, when to do your laundry. So that is not what I want to do. It is me to position myself as a guest and my protocols and my ways come second to the Coast Salish relatives. So I just would like to thank uh, Len for sharing some of your protocols, just as a reminder that how I must carry and that my ways come second to my host. And that's what I mean when I acknowledge that I am on the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of SMT. Okay, I do shorten it. <laughs> All right, um, I do want to uh, take about four minutes and talk about 529 years of colonization. Uh, this is a painting uh, by an amazing uh, Cree Two-Spirit artist, uh, Kent Monkman, and he was recently commissioned by the Metropolitan Museum in on uh, Fifth Avenue in New York to make these two huge murals. Uh, and this one is half of uh, these, they're immense. Um, and they're still up, and I'm hoping to make it uh, to the Met in August to see if I can see these pictures. Welcoming of the newcomers. And you can kind of see um, um, this image uh, um, with the long hair and the high heels. That's Kent's alter ego. Mischief uh, Testicle Eagle is uh, their alter ego's, uh, ego's name. Um, and I also just would like to pause here. And I know that yesterday that there was a lot of attention paid to the 215 in that history and how that we were made aware last week of the tragic news about the former Kamloops residential schools. This is heartbreaking and most upsetting to hear about the parents who have lost babies and children to Canada's genocidal policies as well as actions. More than ever, we must practice kindness, self-care, love with ourselves as well as the world around us. My heart is with the Sequatmec people and nation, as well as my heart is with all of the survivors and their relatives of this school and all of the residential boarding schools. We hold them and I hold them and their loved ones close to my heart and in my prayers at this time. Although this is not new or news to many indigenous people, we've all been here before. What is new and different today are the kind thoughts, the offers of support, of statements of solidarity from our non-native or non-Indigenous relatives to stand with us, to shoulder, carry, and to share some of our pain. These simple acts to ease my, um, eases my heavy heart and gives me hope for tomorrow. More than ever, we as Indigenous people must remember our sacred teachings of who we are and, um, and where we come from. When we know who we are and where we come from and our sacred teachings, there is great medicine as it brings much healing. Additionally, for us to know who we are and where we come from 
and our sacred teachings, it is the ultimate act of resistance. For Indigenous people not to do this, and especially at this time, means that colonization has won and has, for, and has made us forget of who we are, where we come from, and our sacred teachings, and has changed us. We must remember, we must know, and we must be. I shared that statement because my next slide, and I'm so nervous about this, this is a picture from the Carlisle Indian Industrial Residential Boarding School, the first school of its type that opened in 1879, closed in 1918. It was founded by Captain Richard Henry Pratt, this army dude that prided himself on beating folks into submission. This so-called noble experiment was the failed, and I say failed because of programs and events as well as attendees, like this today, of the assimilation of Native American children into the culture of the United States. <coughs> now, why do I start here? Um, Duncan Scott, <clears throat> um, with um, the support of John A. McDonald, went down to this school and uh, actually learned from this and replicated it and used this as a model here in Canada. Um, a part of the 529 col uh, years of colonization. And can he, a recent, or just revisiting our past, and here's a Canadian example. Um, uh, from a, the legal system, in 1928, sterilization begins. The Alberta legislature, legislature, legislature passes the Sexual Sterilization Acts and begins the steriliz, and where do they go? Right to the residential boarding schools, and they begin sterilization of our Indigenous children. Um, and that legislation was repealed only in 1972. So that's in my lifetime. So you know, if you're a little bit younger, uh, it's a, but it's definitely within your parents' lifetime. The only other province in Canada was here in BC. In 1933, BC begins sterilization. And again, that law was repealed in 1973. Um, an American example, the exact same thing happened. Indian Health Services, which was formed in 1955, began uh, sterilization in the 60s as well as the 70s for about a decade. And it's estimated that about 70,000 Native women were sterilized, non-consensually or forced. Um, it's important to note that in 1960 as well as in 1970 was the rise of feminism. Yet there was an entire class of people that were being sterilized. So we must look at our social movements and see whether or not that there's Indigenous people at those because we can see some disastrous consequences in which that the rise of feminism and jurisdiction and domain and sovereignty over one's body, there was no attention paid to our Indigenous uh, relatives. Research. Now, I'm only gonna highlight two, um, two examples. One, a Canadian example and a US, there's hundreds of examples. Um, there were some experiments uh, that lasted about a decade, 1942 to 1952, um, that were performed by the Department of Indian Affairs of Canada. And it was the unethical nutritional experiments that were performed on Canadian Aboriginal ch children at six residential boarding schools. Dr. Percy Moore, Dr. Frederick Tisdell, and it's important to name these names. Um, their experiments, um, food experiments, and this data was used to inform the Canadian Nutritional Food Guide. Parents were not informed and nor was any consent obtained. Even as children died because they were being starved to death, the experiments continued. So you can say, okay, well, maybe these noodles didn't know better, right? Well, this is after the recommendations from the Nuremberg trial and Dr. Death and Mengele in the concentration camps that banned human trial experiments. They knew. Another example is a US study in the 1950s, the US um, Air Force 
former Arctic Aeromedical Laboratory attempted to identify the role of thyroid gland in human acclimatization in cold weather. So what did they do? They rec uh, recruited uh, Native Alaskan elders and, in and had them ingest uh, radioactive isotopes that messed up their thyroid. Now, why do I start with these examples? And definitely around Two-Spirit, right? I start with these examples in that so many times, like the educational system, public health, health, as well as research, as positioned as noble institutes and noble professions. But what I look at that, and I think that for a lot of Indigenous people, when they look at these professions, what they see are handmaidens of colonization. And how these tools and these professions were sites of colonizations and really highly effective tools. And I think as members of these professions, I think what we have to do is to know this history and then to work to redress those histories so that you are in better relations with Indigenous people. And I think that is this, the, um, the call of reconciliation. All right, that was it in six minutes, two minutes over. Um, two Spirit people. So this is the closest thing that you're going to get to a definition of what and who Two Spirit people are. It's not going to be a definition. It's a frame or a framework. Two Spirit is a uh, uh, is an organ a community organizing tool or strategy and not as an identity. It is a way to identify those individuals who are indigenous to Turtle Island and are on the gender and or the sexual orientation spectrum. And once you have those two intersecting identities, it opens up the possibility for someone to answer the call of Two Spirit. If you're not indigenous and if you're not on the LGBTQ um, spec, um, the gender and or the sexual uh, orientation spectrum, you cannot use the term. However, that is only part of the work. So Two Spirit is like a placeholder to organize, but then it becomes a nation specific conversation. And that leads into the next concept that Two Spirit doesn't make sense unless it's contextualized within an indigenous framework or community or setting. Within a traditional setting, Two-Spirit was a gender analysis as opposed to a sexual orientation analysis. Um, some nations had two genders, while others had three, some had four, five, six, seven. Some nations had seven different genders. How do we conceive of a world that has more than two genders? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, today, most people associate the term um, with lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, intersex, as well as the plus is for a lot of other um, identities. Uh, indigenous people. However, the work of Two-Spirit organizations, leaders, elders, and community members is more akin to this traditional understanding of who were we within a pre-contact setting, and then what, are the, what is the application and the relevancy of that knowledge and those teachings within a contemporary setting. Where did the term Two-Spirit come from? A little bit of history. So those nations that had a Two-Spirit tradition, we had our own words within our own language that it named, accounted, and identified our Two-Spirit relatives. In my introduction, um, you know, I said, um, in addition to my name and my nation, I also said that I am Two-Spirit. Miha ayakwe. Ayakwe is how we would say Two-Spirit in my language. That's the identity. That's the end point. Two-Spirit is merely a placeholder and a community organizing tool or strategy. So we had our own words within our own languages. Now I put 1492, because that's kind of a big year for us, right? Uh, that's when CC, I don't even use his real name. That's when in October, CC shows up and puts his flag down and goes, ha ha. I've discovered you, right? And we're like, thank goodness here. Here we are just lost, rambling around on our big old continent. And then Cece comes and discovers us, right? Thank you. Um, a counter narrative, and the narrative that I tell myself of that is that in October 12th, 1492, the indigenous people of Hispaniola, they woke up and they discovered Cece on their shores. 
And so I think there's incredible teaching in that is where is your point of reference? And I love that protocol of recognizing point of reference, not only for land acknowledgement, but what is the point of reference in the telling of a uh, of history? And that we need to have that, that point of reference because you can see how both of those tellings of we being discovered or we discovering CC, they're both truth. They're just from different angles. Now, uh, for, uh, to around 1989, 1990, the term Burdash was used. Burdash is a French word. It's a yucky word. We hate it. We find it very offensive. Its uh, root is uh, from a Persian word, and then it was translated into Italian and then uh, Spanish. And then in the early uh, 16th century, about 1525, it shows up in French as Burdash. Um, we do not like it. It's yucky. Um, but starting in 1975 in the Bay Area with the founding of the Bay Area um, uh, Gay American Indians by Randy Burns, Barbara Cameron, as well as other leaders, there was this beginning of this consciousness and this consciousness raising as Indigenous people as we started uh, gathering together. And that culminated at the 1990 gathering, uh, the third annual Basket and Bow Gathering of Gay and Lesbian Native Americans. And at that gathering, you know, they said, you know, we hate this word Burdash. It's yucky. Um, and for other reasons, they just rejected it. But then the work was how do we organize and how do we organize within a trans or multinational way? Because there was representatives from many nations at that gathering. So after much discussion and many rounds, they landed on the term Two-Spirit. They wanted a term that reflected a combination of both masculinity and femininity, which attributed to males in feminine roles and females in masculine roles. Um, and that is the pivot. The pivot was away from sexual orientation and it was a pivot to gender, your role within society. So baked into the actual, uh, the definition um, of Two-Spirit, that was discussed was a gender analysis as opposed to a sexual orientation analysis. Also, it was, in, it was an act of sovereignty, sovereignty of body and sovereignty of land. The community was like saying, hey, you French missionaries, hey, you members of the academy that are studying us under this um, nomenclature of Burdash, you have no right to name us. That right belongs to us, and we choose two spirit. Sovereignty of body and sovereignty of land. And so baked into that was also a political statement. So how do we conceive of a world that has more than two genders? So here's a list. Uh, this is no, my, by no means complete. Um, it's a survey. I just looked across Turtle Island and I just picked and chose a couple of examples. And um, I'm not going to go through the entire list. I'm only going to compare and focus on Cree um, and a Sioux just so that we can understand what's going on. Okay, so if I were to make you all a part of the Cree nation, right? Like, first of all, how does it feel to be a part of the best nation in the whole wide world? <laughs> Len's going, shut up. <laughs> you too can be a part of the best nation. I'm modeling what pride looks like. And I know that pride is its just how we as we are all members of the best nation in the whole wide world. So how us Crees, how we formed our society, right? Is, is that we had two big dominant camps. We had the men's camp that hunted and then we had the women's camp that gathered. Now there was so much more to their roles. I'm just distilling this down for this example, right? Now, also the way in which that um, we Crees worked is that a man, was never a man was never allowed in a woman's camp and a woman was never allowed in a man's camp. Well, was that good? Was that bad? Mm, we can suspend that. That's a different conversation, right? That's just the way that we formed, right? Also, we spoke different languages. Um, well, that's not really, we spoke a technical language around our work. No different from like, um, here within BCCDC, we, we say STBBI, we say RFA, RFP, right? Um, and you speak a technical language at work, no different from the technical language of our women and no te the technical language of our men. And so if there was ever imbalance or disharmony amongst these two camps, you know, 
a man couldn't walk over to the woman's camp and say, hey, woman, what's going on? And a woman couldn't walk over to the man's camp and say, hey, what are you silly gooses up to today, right? Because they weren't allowed in each other's camps. But us as a Yahweh, we were often schooled in both of the work, gathering, hunting. We were often schooled in the te your technical language and in the intricacies of both the men's language and the women's language. And what was unique was is that we had unfettered and equal access to both camps. So if there was ever imbalance or disharmony, we would play this mediation role where we could go over to the men's camp and we're like, hey men, what's going on? What's happening? We go over to the women and we're like, hey women, what's going on? And we go back and forth and to restore, resolve the conflict or the, and to bring peace, harmony, and um, balance back into these two camps. A man, a woman couldn't do this. A man couldn't do this. Just us as a Yahweh could do this. That was our role. So men hunting, women gathering, we mediating. We just had a different role within society. And it was our little part that we added to the greater, to the glory of the, the whole, you know? And so we didn't have like, a more special or unique or um, a special or uh, role we just had a different role and so those nations that had 12 different genders they had 12 different camps which had a unique and distinct role within their societies that's what we're talking about for gender and a non-binary conception of gender now if i were sue I would not necessarily, there wouldn't be a social expectation that I would be this mediator because I'd be Sue, but there would be a social expectation that I'd be the, the head officiant of a naming ceremony. And so my good friend Del First from the uh, Fort Assiniboine um, uh, Reservation down in Man uh, Montana, um, at, who is Wink Day, that's how we'd say it in his language, um, that uh, he has uh, now officiates over that um, uh, naming ceremonies. Um, and so the takeaway from this entire slide is, is that two-spirit is going to mean something if you're Stolo, Nuchalneth, Anishinaabe, Dene, um, Blackfoot, Sarsi, so again, there can, that's why Two-Spirit is a community organizing tool and not an identity. Implicit with identity is endpoint. Ayakwe, Ilhamana, um, Agukwe, Winkde. That's the identity. That's the endpoint. We'll talk a little bit about that. So I've collected about 130 terms um, and I'm building, I use the uh, base work from Willie Roscow's uh, 1988 scholarship with the Bay American Gay Indians organization. Um, just there is the next nine slides, there is errors, there's omissions, um, and then there's just flat out incorrect, yucky information. And you're like, Harlan, what are you doing? How are you getting out misinformation, right? Well, I wish that I could sit up in the ivory tower and glean through this database and make it pristine, beautiful, and shiny. I do a triple validation process for the entries that I'm working on, meaning that I'll talk to three primary um, uh, language speakers to validate an entry. Um, if I were to do that, that may take a lifetime. Heck, it may, may take an entire three lifetimes. And in that intervening lifetime or times, more of these teachings and more of this knowledge can be lost to the winds of sand and like blowing like sand. So the next nine slides are merely for supporting conversation. So I encourage you to look for your nation. If you don't see your nation, I invite you to see if you can find out what the words are in your language. And if you see your, and if you do that, can you please share that with me so I can update the database? Um, and if you see your nation, like the Cree nation, um, that was validated by 21 uh, primary uh, Cree speakers, is to validate the entry to make sure it's a good, clean entry.
I just got the Nicholnith words within the last 18 months. Uh, so it's been about 75 years um, that these words um, have been brought up in a public sphere. I remember doing a talk and I had a Nicholnith elder, uh, Lillian Howard, that came to me with tears um, saying how, uh, you know, she wished that her relative had known of these words as well as these teachings before they took their life. Um, and because I'm in the S sections, um, I just did a talk for the Stolo Nation and I had an elder gift me their words. And so I have to go back and get the spelling uh, as well as the, uh, the translation. And so we'll have new Stolo words to be added. And again, it's been like generations since these words have been like shown in a public uh, uh, discourse. Uh, Gwasala, uh, that's another BC, and those words were just gifted to me probably within the last two years. So these words are so incredibly important. For where there's a word, there's a story. For where there's a word, there's an experience. But more importantly, where there's a word, um, there is a people. So how these words work is that we say, hey, two-spirit community, we're doing a powwow, right? Or we're doing a, a gathering, right? And if someone answers that call and they show up and they're male assigned and they're Zuni, what we do is we gift them their word, Lachmana, and a framework like this talk to understand and to contextualize that term then the medicine um, of that word is it becomes this unification. In absence of these words, in absence of this framing, often our LGBT queer relatives um, are either forced from their community because they're called fags, queers, dykes, or they're worse, they're beaten, experience physical violence. And they run off to an urban setting like Vancouver, New York, LA, Toronto, and they join the LGBT community because they think they have to make a choice between being LGBT and being an Indian. Only to show up at one of our gathering and they gifted this word Lahamana and a framework. And then the magic and the transformation and the healing power sets in. And how that conversation looks like is, what does it mean to be Lahamana? Who is Lahamana? And what is my role and purpose as a Lahamana for my Zuni people? And roots them and calls them back home and centers their ingenuity. And I've heard that of like, what do you mean I don't have to choose between being LGBT and being Zuni? I can just be? And they're like, yeah. And I've seen people like start powwow dancing again, going back to ceremony, finding out who they are, where they come from and what their sacred teachings are. So these words are so incredibly powerful and so important. We're not alone. If you look at other indigenous communities across the world, although they wouldn't use Two-Spirit, Two-Spirit is only here for Turtle Island, um, we have this like non-binary conceptions of uh, uh, gender. So you have the Bulbul and Hindra in Pakistan and India. You have the Mahu in Hawaii, the Fapapane in Samoa. And I, this, this is again, not even complete. Like Eotura, New Zealand is not on here. And for their male assigned uh, uh, folks, they would be known as uh, Takatapwe. So again, I just have to update this slide. So who were some of our Two-Spirit people of long ago? So this is a picture, uh, these, there's only about 20 known historical images of our two-spirit relatives. And you're seeing about 65% of the known uh, universe. There's only, right to my date right now, there's only one uh, Canadian image and that's the one that's centered um, right in the, um, the frame on the lower part. Um, that is from um, Moose Mountain, Carlisle, Saskatchewan. Uh, and it was taken sometime between 1900 and 1910. It's a postcard size. And the coding with that is two men from Moose Mountain. But you see like the individual that's on your right is wearing a shawl, a skirt, a female breastplate, and, but has a war bonnet. And the coding is two men from Moose Mountain. 
so part of my scholarship is to try to figure out more about uh, who those folks are. And so I'm working with some folks from Treaty 4 to see if I can get some more information on that image. Now, I want to return back to this picture of the Carlisle Indian Industrial Boarding School. What does this have to do with being two-spirit? Well, this has everything and this has nothing to being two-spirit. You're like, hold up, like, what do you mean? That sounds contradictory, right? Well, here is, like, if we decode and deconstruct this image, you have all of the young men and boys at the top part of the picture. And their, their gender expression, and that's connoted with short hair and or wearing pants and those coats. Down on the lower third are all of young women and girls. Gender expression, longish, shoulder length hair, and are all wearing a skirt. If you see in here is, is that there is this imposition of this rigid binary gender system that there are only young men and boys and only young women and girls. Gone are the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. We are not forced to the margins of this picture. We're forced completely out of the framework. That is why this picture has everything and at the same time, it has nothing to do with being two-spirit. This is not our conceptions and understanding of gender, but it was imposed upon us. Now, I wanna say that, you know, my mother, um, just deep talk really personally is, um, no, I'm actually not gonna, not going to talk about that because I'm running out of time. Um, I put myself in the archive. Uh, here's a picture of when I was five. Okay, my fly is open. Why didn't someone close that? I always want to point that out because I don't want anyone to say, that's a great picture, but why is his fly open? <laughs> if you want some more information, uh, there is uh, an hour long uh, recording that dives into this a little bit deeper. It talks about sex and sexuality, which gets really cool. Um, just go to the twospiritjournal.com, type in resources, and um, you can also check out the latest post of uh, the Two Spirit Question Guide to navigate the 2021 Pride uh, season. In summary, Two Spirit, the intersection of those who embody diverse sexualities, gender, gender roles, or gender expressions, and who are indigenous to Turtle Island is a community organizing tool and not an identity. This is incredible. So Two-Spirit is just a placeholder. Um, it's a way to identify those individuals that are indigenous and um, are, uh, that have diverse sexualities and genders. It's going to mean something different depending on what nation an individual is or a member of. Two-spirit uh, refers to a history or a tradition that predates Western notions and concepts, and they're also foreign, such as LGBTQI. And it is about reclaiming and restoring our rightful place of honor, respect, and dignity within our respective nations. As a result of this, Two-spirit is deep decolonizing work and centers one's ingenuity that calls Two-spirit people home and is thereby about mending the sacred hoop. All right, now we can talk about research now that we have a base of understanding of what and who Two-Spirit people are. So this is the Two-Spirit Dry Lab that is um, based here at the BC Center for Disease Control in Chimamook, Indigenous Public Health Program. It's a joint collaboration with uh, UVic, SFU, and the Community-Based Research Center uh, here in Vancouver. Um, this is slide one. Here's more members. Uh, and we just hired Matthew and Zaley as our peer researchers um, who have just joined our team. And you're like, why do you have a kitty cat? Well, Teddy doesn't like their picture in uh, online materials. And so Teddy was like, I just want to be seen as the cutest kitten ever. So I Googled that and that's that picture that came up. But Teddy isn't really a person. Um, how we work. Now, this is incredibly important because often when labs or research groups are formed, there's always this attentiveness on the what 
and the endpoint. Where for us, the how is all is equally important of how are we convening and how do we gather. So what we do as a lab is there is a commitment to centering indigenous ways of being. It is a transdisciplinary or a multidisciplinary collaboration of indigenous and non-indigenous epidemiologists, knowledge translation leads, sociologists, researchers, as well as just community members that want to be a part of research. We also make a commitment to use indigenous methodologies and approaches to our work. We take a two-eyed seeing approach and that I'm so happy that Len had already talked about some of that work, um, but we take a spin on it. It's a two-spirit eyed seeing approach, <laughs> which uh, is kind of cool. Um, meetings and work are done in the circle, meaning that it is collaborative, it's non-hierarchical, and there's also commitment for consensus decision-making processes with the aim or the requirement of the acceptance of all lab members. So what does that all mean? It means what we want to do is when we first came together as a lab, we came and we did ceremony. And what we were doing was calling attention into the sacred space that dwells between all of us lab members, but also between, between and within all of the lab members. If we make it someplace and we don't arrive as a full lab, we have failed. If and wherever we go, if we arrive and there is still love and that honoring of that sacred space that dwells between and within, wherever we arrive will be a good place because we're all there together. So the process or how we're developed, how we convene and how we work is as important as the what. Rather than just saying, here is our goal, let's do this and hammer this out to this goal, the what. So the who is really important, or sorry, the how is really important. So we primarily work uh, uh, with the Sex Now survey, which is one of Canada's longest and long, uh, largest and longest national periodic survey for gay, bi, trans, two-spirit and queer men's health. And we've been working off of the 2015 survey um, back in the day. And um, through our engagement with that survey and the results, we said, mm, we can do better. And so we offered a bunch of recommendations to the 2018 in-person Sex Now survey to better capture health-related and experiential knowledges of Indigenous people. And so we had infused and sprinkled within the 2018 survey, Indigenous only responses. And so the community could see themselves within the survey instrument. And then as a result of that, um, uh, I helped with uh, recruitment because I thought it was really beautiful that they accepted all of our recommendations. So in the 2015 survey, we asked in Q1, your gender identity, and we offered as a variable two-spirit. Q2, we asked, uh, how do you describe your sexual identity? And again, we offered two-spirit as a variable. And then in Q70, uh, we asked about the ethnic and cultural origins. And again, it was 2015, so it used Aboriginal. So the results from that survey um, 2015 survey was about 4.5% of the overall sample size were in Aboriginal, which is a good, you know, good sample size, right? About 156 in, uh, participants selected Two Spirit in either Q1 and Q2. But when we did a cross analysis, um, a cross comparison to of those 156 who were Aboriginal, and what we found that 62% of the respondents were not Aboriginal. So we blew them out of our study, right? Because they were just, we call them culture vultures? No, <laughs> folks that are claiming two spirits that don't have, they're not indigenous, right? Because key to that two spirit is the intersection of ingenuity and LGBTQI. So we said we can do better on how to collect uh, two spirit data. And so on the 2018, one of the recommendations that we had was let's do a three-step process and let's ask Two-Spirit under ethnicity and or cultural identity. And so if you see the structure of the question, then we, you know, for the online, we do skip functions. So if you say, I am Indigenous, then you're offered, uh, are you First Nations, Métis, Inuit, prefer to self-describe, 
or prefer not to say because it may not be safe. And then, and only then, do you get the question is, are you two spirit, yes or no? So from the 2018 <clears throat> in-person survey, it almost is a doubling, 8.9%, almost 9 I just muted myself. Almost 9% of the overall sample size were Indigenous, um, at, which is like pretty dang cool, right? Uh, about 50, about 60% were for, uh, First Nations, about 40% were uh, Métis, 3% were Anuk, and 42% of the Indigenous respondents uh, said that uh, they are Two-Spirit, because not all Indigenous people use the term Two-Spirit, because one, they don't know it, or two, they just don't like it, so we have to give that option. But 0% of the respondents were not Indigenous, so we effectively walled off Two-Spirit for only Indigenous respondents. And because we asked that question first, then later on we asked gender identity and gender expression and also sexual orientation. So it allows for, like for myself, you know, I am Indigenous and I'm Two-Spirit, so I selected there. But then, you know, I'm also gay identified because I walk in the Western world, like taking a two-eyed seeing approach. And, and I identify as a man who's cisgendered, right? And so it allowed me to sit honor how I'm showing up in the Western world as a gay man and who's cisgendered um, as because I already honored my two spirit under ethnicity. And so we can get a much more comprehensive, robust um, uh, picture of your participants. I could have also chose to write in two spirit for gender identity, or I could have chose to write in two spirit for sexual orientation. And that would be singling something about who I am, that Two-Spirit is incredibly important to me. And again, so we can like just tease out what that is and we can get like a really kind of more comprehensive package. Um, CIHR and Meet the Methods, um, we are, were asked and invited and we offered this guidance on how to collect Two-Spirit uh, data in a more culturally affirming and safe way. All right, let's talk about uh, decolonizing research and challenging research. So <clears throat> Apple says, hey, we're both fruit. We both grow on trees. We're both round. That must make us the same, right? And the orange goes, mm, sorry, noodle. No, we're, we are very different, right? But that's how current research in that uh, is, is structured. You have a broader data set, which primarily is often white. We extract a subpop, indigenous our response, indigenous in our way, and what we then do is a compare and contrast. Well, I am never going to be white. I was born an Indian. I'll die an Indian. So why should I be compared to white people? Is that a fair comparison? And then as a result of that, the white people are always going to be the control we're always going to be in a less than mode. That is called a null hypothesis that is infused in all of our policy as well as our research work, where we assume two groups have no differences. Yeah, there's no difference between me and a non-Indigenous person. By showing that there's a difference, further analysis is warranted resulting in innumerable and ad nauseum studies establishing that the health indicators of Indigenous people differ from non-Indigenous counterparts. Not contributing further to any knowledge, but merely rehashing what is already known that we're different. By accepting these differences, we acknowledge that health inequities exist while simultaneously freeing ourselves to look at the strengths in community, but rather than just looking at the deficiencies that rejecting the, the null hypothesis would allow us. So what am I going to, what am I really saying, right? <clears throat> Another way of looking at the null hypothesis, larger data set, extract a small, smaller, and then do the compare and contrast. I was like, if I want to be a part of a research group I do not want to do this type of scholarship and research 
because I do not want to go in front of my Indigenous and Two-Spirit people and say, hey, Two-Spirit people, you're going to get HIV or some STBDI greater than those non-Indigenous people. You're going to have less education, thereby less job opportunities, less, less, less whatever. You're going to die more. You're going to die younger. And in essence, what we're saying is you're bad or you're worse off. And then if there is a non-Indigenous white person in the audience, they hear in the void. What they hear is, I'm going to live longer. I'm not going to get HIV as much as those Indians. I'm going to have a better education, better paying jobs, more opportunities than those Indians. The null hypothesis, I would argue, becomes a site of white supremacy. I do not want to do that. We do not do no hypothesis. What we do is we do intra-group analysis. You can see the diversity that exists within oranges, right? From this, the sepia tones of the Hamilton to the richness of the blood orange. Then there's like sweet, uh, sweet oranges compared to bitter oranges, right? The ones that little just hurt your cheeks. These are fairer comparisons. And you, I've already just started picking out some comparisons where we're in, we are comparing oranges to oranges, two-spirit and indigenous people to two-spirit indigenous people. So what does that look like in scholarship? So um, very, very shortly, uh, there will be a peer-reviewed journal article. It's being translated into French right now, uh, it, where we look at the drivers of sexual health knowledge for Two-Spirit and GBM Indigenous men. In this study, we compared responses. First of all, we had quantified um, uh, the drivers of sexual health knowledge. Then what we did was, after we could quantify the drivers of sexual health knowledge, um, we compared the responses of those who use Two-Spirit to those that describe themselves as Indigenous people who did not use Two-Spirit. And what we found that there were significant differences in the drivers of sexual health knowledge between those two populations. Then we're like, huh, are there differences in the drivers of sexual health knowledge along uh, geographically for those that live in urban compared to rural and remote areas? And once again, we found significant differences. From this analysis, we can offer evidence-based as well as wise practice, uh, practices or guidance, either policy and programmatic, for those that are working or wanting to work with Indigenous Two-Spirit people and communities in more respectful, mindful, relevant, responsible, and reciprocal ways. That's how research can be done. Now, there's also some more radical things in which the, the Two-Spirit um, two Dry Lab does. So um, <clears throat> I'm sure that most folks are familiar with Audrey Lord and Audrey Lord's um, um, amazing statement of the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So this comes the broader quote, and I think it is most powerful that we must contextualize it. Those of us who stand outside of the circle of society's definition of an acceptable woman, those of us who are forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to make our differences and to take our differences and make them our strengths. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I firmly, firmly believe that. However, we take a little bit of a spin on it. In that, yeah, it's right. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. But some of the master's tools are good, like my comfy conference shirt. I'm not wearing those scratchy leather, right? Um, so what we do is we take some of the master's tools we ignore the master's house and we go down the block and we build our own house. So what does that look like? Um, how many folks know what uh, the theory of syndemics is? So the theory, it's this big HIV and STBBI theory right now that a lot of people are using. And basically, Meryl Singer, this white researcher, was studying uh, Latino folks in Connecticut around HIV. 
And what Merrill Singer showed um, and coined the term syndemics, um, basically what, what they showed was that syndemics is a mutual reinforcing and interaction of disease and social conditions. So basically what um, Singer was like saying was like, if you look at someone who's experiencing violence, that it may increase their risk of getting HIV or the chances of getting HIV by 10%. If someone is experiencing substance use, another at 10%, or someone that is experiencing adverse mental health as a result of systemic racism. Now it'd be like, don't quote me on the 10%, I'm just doing, pulling numbers, right? So you would think, okay, adverse mental and violence, if someone is experiencing all three, it should be 10 plus 10 plus 10. 30, right? A 30% increase in the chances of getting HIV. Well, what they saw was there was this, uh, showed through this um, math, um, is that there was this like amplification that happened that if someone was experiencing violence, substance use, and adverse mental health, that it may increase their chances of getting HIV to 95%. And so it again is mutually reinforcing interaction of disease and social conditions. Well, that's kind of cool, right? And when I first like heard this, I was like, oh, that's interesting. But how is this different than the Sioux expression metakriosin? Metakriosin translates into all my, it's a heart language and it's usually said in ceremony. And the language, uh, what it translates into is literally is all my relations. But I think a closer translation is everything is connected. Everything is related. And you see that within this picture and how everything is connected together as one cohesive image. The lines um, from the thunder beam are all connecting the stuff in the sky, to the trees, to the ground, to the land, to the water, back up to the people, back up to the thunderbird, and it just keeps on going around. Does that sound like something? We do not use syndemics. We ignore the master's house. First of all, get some humility. You think you thought of this in 1994. Meanwhile, we have a little expression, metakriose. Been there, done that. Get some humility. We do not use the theory of syndemics. We use the theory of metakriosin. We build our house by using quantitative analysis, but we affirm and build our indigenous houses that affirm our worldview, our ways of being. Health research for two-spirit people, when data is collected in a culturally safe way, you can promote better and more rigorous science. Research conducted this way has the, expand, uh, the potential to expand our understanding of health within a diversity framework. And we are better to formulate health research policies and programs that are relevant to the diversity of our entire population. It is really reconciliation in research. Now, in my last moments, I would like to just take a little bit of time and I would like to talk to my Indigenous relatives at this time. And how I started, from how Len started, to how um, now, is to overcoming challenges and disrupting the ordinary. Like, we're not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be here. From that residential boarding school, as well as those other examples that I opened with. Every, <laughs> it makes us an activist by just breathing. Every breath we take is an act of survival. Every exhale is an act of resistance, or what we say is survivance. There is such strength and power in just simply breathing. Now, growing up on my mother's reservation, I was so ashamed of being an Indian because as Wab Canoe points out, Indian always had an adjective. Stupid Indian, drunk Indian, dumb Indian. So there was immense amount of internalized racism that I had that I was so ashamed. And then I was a little sissy boy and people called me like bag and queer. 
And in really, really supported ways, I called those home and they became places of great strength. So much so that I was called upon twice by President Obama. Why? Because I was a little sissy boy gay Indian that did a little bit of policy work. It's our secrets that keep us sick. And so I share these teachings with you because they've been freely shared with me. Take what resonates with you and ignore the rest of overcoming challenges and disrupting the ordinary. One is know your creation story as um, the third protocol that Lynn opened up around our origin stories. Take a little bit of time and ask yourself, where did I come from? Who am I? And what are my sacred teachings? And bind yourself to those sacred teachings. My creation story tells me, uh, tells me my secret and charges me with my sacred teachings of wisdom to cherish all knowledge, love that I may know peace, respect to honor all creation, courage, and this is the one I struggle with so much because courage is to face a foe with integrity. Sometimes I just wanna grind them up to dust but for me not to respond with my other sacred teachings is to forget who I am. Honesty, to know myself and the world, rigorous honesty with self and with others. Humility, to know myself as a sacred part of creation that is no better than any other component or other part. And truth, to know all these things. Know who your people are. Every morning when my feet hit the ground, when I wake up, I go, today's another day to work for a better tomorrow for my true spirit relatives. I know who my people are. When you answer this question, it'll provide a rooting, grounding, humility, accountability, respect, transparency, and a lived and embodied truth or medicine. Now, rarely do indigenous people speak in definitives. But I will, abso with absolutism, I will say that the creator does not make mistakes. That we are all placed here for a reason, or we all have a purpose or gift and or gifts, medicine and or medicines to dispense. Take a little bit of time and say, why the heck am I here? What are my gifts and medicine and what's my purpose? When you answer this question, you will have all of the motivation to guide all of your actions. Always ask yourself why. If something, just because something has been done that way in the past, doesn't exempt it from questioning or that it must always be done that way. The why, the question to this, the answer to this why question also carries a huge responsibility. If no one is saying what you're thinking, I encourage you and pray for you that you can sit tall, square your shoulders, hold your head high and speak your truth. Find your voice. When you find your voice, it'll be rooted in your purpose. You will not only be speaking for yourself, but you'll be speaking for your people and it will be rooted within your creation story. If not me, then who? If you're asked to do something or about something, ask yourself if you're the right person to fulfill this request. If there's someone better, defer and refer. It'll only make you stronger. If no one is, if there's no one else, then the if not me, then who? The who becomes you. You have to step up. But if you've answered these other questions, it will be done with a good heart and in a good way, and it will be a good way. And finally, the last teaching is, this is the hardest teaching you have walked or are walking or will walk. And that is belief and trust in yourself, to love yourself, to be kind with yourself. It is scary to walk a new path, but it is often what as leaders we must do. You know, when I was called upon and I was like sitting at this big table and advising the White House, I was like, what the Nikes am I doing here? But because I'd answered and taken the time 
and with good goodness in my heart, with good intent, and also the ability to like fall and to make mistakes and to say, oops, and it's a learning opportunity. I share these in closing of how we can overcome and challenge, overcoming challenges and we can disrupt the ordinary. And I think this is a, a way in which that I have embodied decolonization in which we challenge status quo. And thereby we work for a better tomorrow and we are in good relations with one another where we honor and celebrate the sacred space that dwells between and within all of us. References, how I say a formal thank you is uh, in Cree to a group, is Kenonas Komteninawawa, and uh, hi hi is in saying formally. And the closest expression that we have to goodbye is Examaga. Examaga translates into that's it for now. Yay, the A is important. Um, or a closer translation is uh, now that our, like, unlike the finality or goodbye of English, like, there's no more. Uh, Examaga means like now that our paths have crossed, they're forever intertwined and they will pass cross again, either in this life or in some other life. It is with the greatest humility and honor that I say, hi, hi, Examaga. Wonderful. Hi, Chika. Thank you so much, Harlan. Every single minute was so incredibly rich, powerful, and if I might say, so incredibly healing. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and, and uh, um, just taking the time to be here and guide us through a lot of this work. I have pages worth of notes. Um, and and um, I know that we're a little bit over time, so I do want to release everybody for a break. Um, but I'm wondering, Harlan, if you have a couple of minutes to stay behind. Every, we're meeting back here in this virtual space. Is that correct for our next session? Yes, that is correct. You can stay right here. Okay. Nancy! So we'll stay here. <laughs> So we'll stay here. We'll close the session. Um, feel free to stretch your legs, grab some water, re refill up your coffee cups. We will start again at 1045 with our next session um, called Changing the Tide, Indigenizing uh, Research with Indigenous Women Living with HIV to Explore, Understand, and Support Their Health. Uh, Harlan, if you have a couple of minutes to hang out and, and answer any questions, if folks yeah, have any totally. we'll see uh, everybody back here at 1045. Thank you, everybody.